Hello, everyone. Uh, so, thanks for the invitation to be here. My name is Elena. I'm a marine biologist, uh, actually working with CV that I can say now for over 20 years. Uh, and then one of the founders of the company, uh, the Portuguese company uh, Alga Plus. Uh, we are dedicated to uh, sustainable uh, Atlantic uh, seaweed farming and to the valorization of the seaweed biomass we produce. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is just the global seaweed market. Uh, we all know this more or less. And uh, like other colleagues in Europe, uh, we at Alga Plus are dedicated, focused mostly in the food, cosmetics, and then uh, uh, added value in the functional food and feed uh, uh, products. <clears throat> Seaweed in Europe has been used for a long time, uh, uh, from uh, since their historic detail from the 18th, uh, 18th century and even before, as sea vegetables and uh, more recently as food ingredients, cosmetic ingredients, and even before as agriculture. Uh, in the recent years, what we have witnessed is that the supply of EU organic certified seaweed, so produced in Europe, is not enough to meet increasing demand for these products. And the sourcing is based on wild harvest and importations, mostly from Asia and has been preventing the development of, uh, of some products. And if we look more into Portugal, uh, seaweed, as I say, it's a forgotten tradition. Uh, we have a, a strong maritime activity and in fact, uh, seaweed have been consumed also as in other European countries. Uh, we have a high biodiversity of species with market value and a strong heritage in some of our coastal communities. And all this led that we created the uh, Alga Plus in 2012. Uh, dedicated, as I mentioned, to seaweed farming. And we do this in a special way, I may say. We are located in a coastal lagoon, a salt a seawater coastal lagoon, uh, receiving uh, the nearby uh, input from seawater. And we have our system uh, set in an integrated way. So we have the fish, sea bream and sea bass, and then we have seaweed. We use the water rich in nutrients from the fish to uh, feed our seaweed system. It's an area of 14 hectares set in a Natura 2000 site, and this, uh, for the ones you don't know, it's an ecological uh, protection area. Um, this integrated system allows us to have organic certific certification in our products, uh, as well as a clean label production. So it means we don't add anything to our uh, the seaweed production. We do this year round and with a strong focus in R&D. Oops, sorry. So we have uh, the system set that we can control our production from the seed up to the finished product. We have a nursery with a culture collection. We have land-based tank system, and then we have a processing facility certified according to uh, international food safety uh, standards. Uh, in all this system, we have uh, a year-round, as I mentioned, but we are also versatile for several species, and we have uh, traceability uh, along the way. Uh, R&D has been our backbone from uh, developing our production system, processing protocols, uh, and also allows us to have uh, customized, dedicated services to some of our customers. Uh, this allows, allows us to achieve some uh, proprietary knowledge, as I mentioned again, from the cultivation system to the protocols, uh, to some varieties that we have in culture of seaweed, uh, up to uh, new developments in terms of uh, production and harvesting. This is what we have. This is our seaweed unit uh, in which we, as I mentioned, it provides us biomass, but is also providing ecosystem services uh, that at this point, these later are not uh, valorized. We have currently a, a system, a tank system that it's uh, it's a semi control system, so we can uh, manipulate and customize the, the conditions here and uh, control what comes in and what comes out. And this is a recent developments. We have upscaled our production and we have a new raceway system in operation uh, since November last year. Um, in this, uh, uh, this system to, nowadays, we have a capacity of producing 160 tons per year. Uh, it's a high productive system. And when we talk about uh, uh, ecosystem services, because we are operating an integrated system, we are removing uh, nitrogen and carbon uh, every time we harvest uh, our seaweed. And these credits are not valorized yet by us. Okay. So we farm currently five species and Sander, as you mentioned, we have uh, two green algae and three red algae. The sea lettuce is the one that is, uh, as I mentioned, our, as I say, our cash cow in the company. And then we have uh, other uh, green species, the codium, mostly used for cosmetics. And then these three red algae from nori up to dulse uh, that are used mostly in uh, food. 
Uh, our seaweed is uh, transformed then into uh, or processed into fresh or dried products. And these are sold uh, mostly in the food sector and then cosmetics, feed, and also to R&D. Uh, we operate mostly in the B2B uh, uh, business, uh, uh, providing these biomass and also uh, services uh, for these uh, companies, uh, mostly uh, dedicating new uh, species and culture, customized biomass and technical advice. We are exporting most of our uh, produced volume. We are present uh, in, uh, in uh, a few dozen uh, countries already, uh, from Australia up to North America, uh, but our main uh, markets is France, uh, UK and Holland uh, nowadays, and you can see here in this map. We also have uh, a presence in the consumer market, so this goes from uh, uh, food mostly and well-being, uh, operating in the, with the distributors and in whole, wholesalers and also online. We have uh, four uh, own brands uh, that we are uh, in, with which we promote our products that are seaweed, but also other products that include the seaweeds that we are producing, developed uh, mostly with uh, other uh, partners, other companies. Uh, R&D has also led us to new products in development, as again, this is a trend. So we have from burgers, uh, some with meat, some with fish, others vegan. Uh, and the, the idea is always to have tasty and convenient uh, food products uh, that we can have health and nutritional claims uh, by the end. Um, and what we, for us, what we've been developing is promoting uh, the, the consumption of seaweed by the, the industry and also at the same time having uh, access to some proprietary formulations of these products. Very important for us is our outreach and social responsibility that we have started since 2012. Any work with schools, with the professional students uh, and the, some uh, institutions uh, that also package, um, do our, some of our um, packaging for our products and we promote technical tourism always with the idea of uh, uh, showing people what are seaweed, how, what, how do they grow and what they can be used for uh, in a way of disseminating and uh, uh, um, how do I say widespread the word about uh, seaweed. We are also active in some uh, rele uh, relevant sectorial work groups, some of them already mentioned by Sander, the European Normalization Committee, but also in the International Seaweed Association and the, the, the Safe Seaweed Coalition and Seaweed for Europe, and also some national clusters and, uh, and sectors for aquaculture and algae production. And this is very important to uh, spread the word. During these years, uh, almost 10, we've been recognized from our for our entrepreneurship uh, nationally and globally, and uh, I'm very happy to say that this has been a, a long road, but also a happy one. <laughs> uh, just an overview, and I think it's important from the evolution steps of our company. As I mentioned, I'm a biologist, and the, and the Alga Plus was created by me and a colleague, also a biologist, uh, and the idea was generated in 2006. It took some years to kick off the company, and uh, we have had an evolution in these last years that uh, uh, had a, a strong jump in 2017 when we had new shareholders and then uh, in 2020 <laughs> we had a kind of a standby like everyone else but during these years where uh, we were uh, able to uh, develop the sector in in portugal and nowadays there are more companies uh, uh, starting to operate uh, seaweed aquaculture farms in portugal and this is very important for us uh, also and as a promoter of the of the sector Nowadays, in 2021, we are uh, uh, recovering from the COVID impact. We had new shareholders coming in in February this year. We have an investment plan foreseen up to 2022 of 2 million euros, mostly for upscaling production and invest in quality and people. Uh, and people are our main asset, like in all the other companies. We are today 16 people, um, very well balanced in terms of genera. And as you can see, we also have fun uh, uh, working in the Alga Plus most of the day, especially when it's warm. So by participating here, we are looking for uh, promoting basically the seaweed sector, seaweed farming in Western countries, but also uh, interested in discussing with some of you uh, uh, listening to, to us today, uh, customers that are looking for seaweed ingredients uh, or some uh, seaweed-based food products, uh, distribution partners, uh, mostly outside of Europe that we are trying to expand our, our, our um, distribution channels because we are upscaling production now, 
and of course more globally anyone interested really in combining efforts and collaborating to develop uh, the seaweed farming sector here in western countries obrigada thank you so much for listening and i'm open to your questions thank you so much thank you so much elena it's fantastic <laughs> to see it. there's definitely a trend of uh, seaweed picking up around the world and many companies jumping on board uh runa if you'd like to pull up your slides hopefully you can hear us and everything's working yes everything is working now so let's see mm -hmm. i'll remind you to switch off your cameras if uh, you're not one of our speakers and and make sure to mute your microphone yeah uh hello my name is uh, runa talvik i'm uh, the CEO and one of the founders uh, behind uh, Taxlo Seafood. Pa all, sorry to interrupt you. I, we can't see your slides. Oh, you can't see it. Uh, two seconds. seconds. Uh, oh. There they come. There they come. All right. Perfect. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, here at the picture you can see the beautiful island of Taxlo, uh, which we got our name from. Uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to present our company here at the BlueTech Global Connect. So Taxlo is based in Norway, just 40 minutes outside uh, Bergen. Uh, yeah, our, our vision is to create great international brands of seaweed products. And uh, to do that, we use sustainably harvest the seaweed from the North Atlantic Ocean. We do uh, some harvesting ourselves, as you see here at the picture. This is uh, harvesting uh, Laminara hyperborea, which we have like 50 to 70 million tons of here in Norway. Uh, and we also work together with the wild harvesters in Iceland and Ireland and Scotland, and also seaweed farms here in Norway. And that's just to make sure that we have enough seaweed when the market uh, really starts to to rally and we're also in the process of applying for our own seaweed farms here at the uh, just outside Bergen app. So the problem uh, we see is that it's three different kind of problems. The first one is uh, health related and we see that in uh, in the world we have like two billion people which have a lack of uh, iodine in their uh, in the diet which uh, is, isn't so good. And the other one is related to agriculture, and we see that the farming soil has seen a 20% degradation of vitamins and minerals in, uh, in, in the soil since the 1920s. And the last one is that uh, it's a lot of pollution and chemicals surround, surrounding us now, and uh, it has been a severe increase in skill, uh, skin allergies the latest years. So the tax resolution, we, uh, we make uh, food products which is tasty and easy to use in everyday cooking. That's uh, done in the brand Shuesaka, which we made. Uh, and for all the seaweed, which we can't uh, use as food grade, that we use uh, in our liquid seaweed fertilizer, which will be coming in a brand called Sea Fertile. And for the skincare, we have uh, developed a special formula of uh, using dulls, where we have uh, uh, ferment at it and it uh, has great potential and works great for in skincare for rebalancing balancing the skin. And to reach all, uh, reach all uh, customers, we are using all the latest in the marketing technology and we are, yeah, we are in all the social media and like TikTok and Snapchat and yeah, everything just to build the brand awareness and build a large customer base. So what's this Sjøsaka? So directly translated from uh, Norwegian to English, it's called like things from the sea. And that uh, fits perfectly with the, with the seaweeds. So since we started to sell our products in June 2017, we have sold our products to 15,000 Norwegian customers. That's 0.27% of all, all the Norwegians. We have sold 60,000 products. Um, we have our products in several grocery stores around the Norway, like uh, Rematusen, Mini Bun Place Bar. And we also have a lot of chefs using our seaweed in, in the menu. And we're using the seaweed on uh, Bar, which was the first uh, restaurant in Bergen, get their Michelin star. 
And here in down on the picture, you can see the different kind of uh, seaweed spices we make. And the reason why we use our made seaweed spices is that we saw that the customer needed something that they was already familiar to use. And uh, yeah, so that's fit perfectly. And this is also the first uh, taco seasoning in the world with seaweed in it. So the potential market for the food uh, series of Sjösaka. Yeah. So from a research in Norway and all uh, result from our advertising, we see that uh, it should be, should be at this point 27 million potential customers in Europe and United States. That's for all the seaweeds company, but that's customers that's already already ready to use seaweed in their in the diet. And we have estimated that this will grow to uh, 100 million by 2030. So on the picture here, you see your next product, which will be launched in just a couple of weeks. That's a iodine supplement made from three different kinds of seaweeds. So Cifatil, that will be a series of uh, liquid uh, fertilizers, and that's optimized for uh, different applications, like for roses and for fruits and berries and yeah. And uh, the brand is under development. We are doing a research project now to find the optimal uh, uh, combination of the seaweeds to use in it. Yeah, and, and by using the seaweed, which uh, don't have the food grade quality, we managed to use 100% of the seaweed we harvest. For the potential market in, in organic fertilizer, that's uh, since COVID came, it was a lot of people starting to grow their vegetables home. And they really wanted to have organic uh, fertilizer. And the prices on organic fertilizers goes on like 15 euros a liter. And uh, from a residue production, we can, yeah, we have a production cost per liter on only two euro. So for the skincare brand, that's also under development. We have, uh, we're just ready to start testing the first batch of the different formulas. Uh, this series has been made directly to the Chinese market, and we're all already in dialogue with a couple of interested companies that which uh, wants to distribute and sell the products. Um, yeah, we're working together with a great uh, producer. She's won several uh, different international awards for another customer she produced for. And we're making a unisex series, which can be used by both female and male. And the products have been developed with focus on repairing the skin, and we're only using natural ingredients with a with an extract from the dulse as one of the most important ingredient. Yeah. So for the skincare potential market, uh, that's one of for in China at least, it's one of the fastest growing market in the world. It's estimated to reach sixty billion dollars by twenty twenty five, and the trends in China sees that the, the Consumers uh, are looking for organic and natural products, and uh, yeah, we, which have the ability to repair the skin. This is the team uh, of the original founders behind uh, Taxlow. Uh, all of us came from the oil industry. Uh, me and uh, Jan Pata worked together in Nokia Solution, and me and Robert have been childhood friends from uh, yeah from early age. So yeah, we, we all of us wanted to uh, do something bad and uh, we all had a love for the ocean. And uh, so we saw that in 2016, the chefs in uh, uh, and started to using seaweeds on the menu. The company was started in 2016 and uh, yeah, it has been a really interesting uh, tour so far. Yeah, and so at the end, so what we are looking for at this stage, we are now, uh, we're looking to do, do a Serie A founding in uh, early 2022, looking for 7.5 million in founding euro. And that's for accelerating the growth uh, for the existing products and also develop new products. We have uh, uh, one Fucoidan product uh, in our pipeline and also a vegan series of uh, seafood products. Now we're also looking for international partners, and that's to bring our seaweed uh, products and brands out to the consumers. And to, uh, to make sure that we have enough seaweed uh, for, uh, for the growth, 
we are also looking for international suppliers of high quality North Atlantic seaweeds. So that was that from me. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Runa. Great to get a taste of all the different benefits of seaweed. So Yost, I see you pulled up your slides. Go ahead. Oh, I think you're on mute, just so you know. I was. Can you see the, the slides correctly, Tamara, from your slides? If you would go ahead and put them in uh, presentation mode, then they'll be nice and big. Yes, uh, yes, there we go. Perfect. All right, uh, welcome and really great to be here uh, wherever you are in the world to uh, present the, uh, the Seaweed Company to you. And um, just for the people who have not uh, learned enough over the last uh, three presentations, uh, if you look at the, the, the seaweed as a, the potential it has, it is really a unique untapped resource. It contains the ingredients for many applications for humans, animals and soil. It's a very important contributor to restore the state of the oceans. And if you look at the industry and the expansion uh, outside of Asia, actually the market is very immature. So it's a globally scalable uh, business uh, that helps to uh, solve quite some societal problems such as coastal ecosystems, human health and well-being and sustainable farming. So three years ago we uh, established uh, the Seaweed Company and right now, two and a half years later, we are a revenue generating uh, front runner in Europe. We have a multi-species approach. That means we grow different, um, different colors of, of, um, uh, of species. We are demand driven. We have two concepts, blue farming and blue health. And I will share more about that uh, later. And we have an end-to-end -end approach. So we have the whole chain vertically integrated from the sourcing and cultivation of seaweed up till uh, formulating the end product. And if I take you a little bit through our journey, we started in 2018 and we've built uh, the seaweed company base where we've pioneered, developed, uh, validated, and we've built some partnerships. And over the last two and a half years, we have uh, uh, founded five farms. We have five seaweed farms in Morocco, India, in Ireland and the Netherlands. We have four concepts, cultivation concepts that we can roll out. And right now we have cultivated about over 50 tons of dry matter and that's uh, our monthly rate right now is about 30 to 40 tons dry. Um, if you look at the next step, uh, as of tomorrow, we are looking to exponential impact uh, in Europe. And then five years later, we would like to have global impact on that. Now, just a, a brief view on the team. The most important people are, are, are uh, behind. We have a team of about 20 people, very passionate about seaweed, bringing in all uh, different expertises and, 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 uh, yeah, and, and ways to, to contribute to our, uh, to our seaweed company. And the leadership team is a quite uh, yeah, diverse team with sales, marketing, uh, financial, biology uh, and strategy uh, experiences. Now, I just talked about the fact that we have an end-to-end -end approach, so from cultivation to uh, the formulation of product. And we think in this stage of the industry, that's very important. So we have a quality assurance of all the elements. And in the future, we might be able to outsource several steps in the upstream or downstream part. But right now, we think the only way to be successful is to cover that whole, whole chain. And this is a view of the different seaweed species that we uh, cultivate. Most of them we cultivate but some of them we have strategic partnerships to source. And this means that we have a broad variety uh, of seaweeds to create different portfolio for our, for our products. And to get an idea about our operations, here you see our Moroccan operation where we mainly grow uh, uh, ulva, the sea lettuce. On the right, you see our factory in India where we uh, grow and process uh, red seaweeds. Uh, here on the left, you see our uh, Irish um, uh, farms that we have in Mulroy Bay and Clue Bay. And we have our own uh, R&D center where we do our own research and see how we can uh, yeah, support the seaweed seedlings and, and, and improve on, on, on that part of the, of the value chain. 
As well, we have our engineering team and we are developing our own machinery and prototypes for harvesting machines, for instance, for automated seeding of nets and ropes. And finally, uh, one of the concepts that we are actively involved in is a project called United, which is an EU funded project. And this is the very first global um, offshore farm, a seaweed farm that we are putting uh, 12 kilometers in front of the Dutch shore with, uh, let's say, 14 meter high waves and, and strong currents. Now, if you look at what we are doing with the, the, the coming years and how we are, uh, our strategy works, is we focus basically on four areas. As I said in the beginning, we focus on blue farming and blue health. And with these two fo focuses, we are using the blue power of the sea, the, 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 the seaweed and, uh, and, 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 and the restoration of oceans, to accelerate uh, sustainable agriculture and also to support human health and well-being and, and, and the shift to sustainable diets. The third strategy is of the, the expanding of what I just showed. So the farms that we have, the cultivation concepts that we can expand over the world. And the fourth step is to build a, uh, an ecosystem, a platform with people, the process and the partnerships where we can really grow together uh, the seaweed industry. So if I go quickly through those four concepts, then this is our blue farming concept. So we have a range of products that can be used for animals, soil uh, and plants, and that help uh, farmers to create a regenerative uh, agricultural approach. So due to our products, animals need less feed for, for the same performance. They, um, their methane emissions reduce. The soil can absorb more carbon. So the, uh, there is a there is an effect on, on carbon capturing there, and the beauty is at the same time we are regenerating the ocean, so increasing marine life, marine biodiversity, and absorbing CO2. The same goes for the blue health concept, although this is then focused on human health and well-being. So we have several products, health supplements. We have a a cream that is meant for skin immunity to support skin immunity. And we are looking, uh, we are developing a product we call hybrid products, where we implement seaweed and traditional meat in this case. If you look at the cultivation side, as I said, we have four concepts now for each of the uh, species that we can roll out uh, all over the globe. And that is our focus as well on, on the seaweed farms. And finally, uh, building the uh, ecosystem is mainly based on increasing our R&D uh, functionality on marine biology, the engineering and the bioscience. It's creating partnerships. One of our partnerships is with a big um, uh, Dutch uh, brewer where we have launched a product with, with a seaweed extract in it. And of course, building a platform with, with our people. And I think that this has over the last years that has been proven very strong. We have not at a standstill due to COVID. We could continue, although via Zoom and with local teams. And we see that it's a very strong element in our business model. But most and for all, we are an impact company. And if you look at the different SDGs that we uh, influence, you see them here. You can't read them, but we have for each SDG, we have an, uh, a user case. And just to give you one example on the right, you see uh, a, a company that uses our uh, Top Health Plants product, which is a biostimulant, and that has actually a threefold impact on carbon capturing. First, the carbon gets captured by the, the, the seaweed growing in the sea. Secondly, uh, if we use it over the soil, the soil will absorb more carbon, up to 25% more over three years. And thirdly, the farmers don't need to use fossil fuel fertilizers and poisonous pesticides anymore. So this is a complementary effect on, on carbon uh, sequestration, which is we are extremely proud of that. So my final sheet is what do we need to realize our mission? We need help. We know our mission is ambitious and we can't do this by ourselves. So for the coming uh, four to five years, we require a fund of about 20 to 25 million euro. Um, apart from that, we're looking for strategic partnerships on our two concepts, the blue farming and the blue health. And you can think about a product range for animals, uh, health supplements, the hybrid burgers, etc. And finally, we have a very cool uh, thing that we introduce as of next week. We will certify, uh, we will publish our own certi certi certificate. So for people who want to support our mission and partly offset uh, their footprint, they can donate or they can uh, put a gift to our company and they will get a, 
uh, a certificate, which is actual carbon registration in our farms uh, as a, in return. So this was my presentation. I look forward to any question that you might have. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Joost. Fantastic. Three very different stage and interesting companies. So um, I think we do have a few questions already in the chat. And I know Sanders ready to go to have a nice conversation with these three speakers. So yeah, um, thanks. Uh, thanks to my finding off. Yeah, thanks, uh, Una, Elena and Joost for the presentations. Uh, indeed, my pleasure to uh, to moderate the Q&A. So to all in the room, uh, do ask your questions in the chat uh, and I can uh, pass them on to the speakers. The first two questions that were there were for Helena. So, uh, well, you're first. So they were on the on the tonnage, wet or dry. And the other question yeah. was if, if there are different challenges for different species, dolls and, uh, and green seaweeds were mentioned explicitly. Yeah, so re regarding, and thanks for the, the question, I cannot see the name, but anyway, it's okay. Um, the uh, It's it's wet, it's wet weight, okay, uh, it's a fault, a fault there. It's wet weight uh, regarding the 4,000.2 uh, more or less square meters that we have, uh, um, that we will have in, the, by, in production by the end of this year, yeah. And the and other question was, are ah, the challenges? Yeah. Yeah, well, that is a very good question, actually. Um, uh, it is very challenging today. It's it's quite different. So when we mentioned that we started uh, and our cash cow is ulva, uh, ulva I would say it's the easiest seaweed to grow into our regarding our um, our experience these years when we talk about uh, uh, these land based and smaller species. Of course, it has uh, protocols that need to be adapted throughout the year to be able to have a consistent yield and a consistent quality. Otherwise, seaweeds normally can get stressed and uh, we can lose all our production in a few days. So this is the main uh, uh, main uh, concern with the uh, ulva production, with the green seaweed, maintaining quality and consistency of the yield. But it's uh, we do it in uh, what we call um, uh, vegetative propagation. So we are not going through the whole cycle of the whole life cycle of production of the seaweed. Uh, it's the relative short production cycles. We can say that it's between two to four weeks production cycles that we can have throughout uh, the year. Regarding dolls, uh, to my knowledge, nowadays there isn't still a, a commercial scale farmer for dolls uh, uh, in the Western countries. Most of the, most of the dolls that is uh, used today in uh, food and product development is wild harvest. Uh, and DOS is, uh, there's been a lot of uh, PhDs, master students research uh, globally around uh, DOS cultivation. And uh, even uh, when I mentioned that we are cultivating it today, we can only do it a few months per year and it's still at a very small scale. So it is a very challenging species. Uh, you can do uh, dolls farming by uh, going through the full production uh, life cycle or the full life cycle of the species. This means having females and males and having the gametophytes and the sporophytes. So um, for people that are not biologists, we don't need to be here explaining everything, but it's a more complex cycle, or we can do it also um, by pro uh, propagation. But it's still, there's still a lot of research to be done in order to be able to have a, a commercial scale. So actually, I think it is a good question because when, when, uh, when I listened as a seaweed farmer uh, trying to farm uh, dolls for a long time, uh, and even when I was uh, doing research, uh, I think that uh, uh, for the, 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 the companies uh, working in product development, please be aware that is not yet uh, fully available uh, at, a, uh, at a consistent price, uh, dolls biomass nowadays. So we can be focusing on product development using that raw material and then face a, a serious bottleneck when we need to then to, um, to uh, acquire. Uh, dolls biomass to expand. Yeah, so this is uh, an issue. Yeah, sorry, I went yeah. too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Thanks for that answer. It's interesting. No worries. Thanks. Um, so, two new questions popped uh, up by Mike, and I guess they are of concern to all three of you. So, uh, let me start uh, with Runar, uh, since it mentioned uh, wild harvest. Um, the question here is if there is a, an atlas that, that, that identifies where the commercially relevant species occur naturally. And, and second part of that question, if there's any guidance on sustainable seaweed culture and, and wild harvesting. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, we've been in a project through something called uh, Norges Val, uh, working together with uh, companies in Faroe Island, Iceland, Ireland, and Scotland. Where one of the goal is to make uh, a guidance and for especially wild harvesters and how to harvest the seaweed. And yeah, as we don't uh, harvest too much and that we don't. Uh, it, some of the species is very val valuable, uh, vulnerable, like uh, sugar kelp, and uh, you see that you can't wild harvest that because you can risk that it collapse. So, so it's a project going on uh, with that. According to the seaweed atlas, um, don't think I can answer that one. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I think Helena wants to yeah. jump in there. Yeah. Yeah, I can say something on the well in both uh, subjects, uh, and then I'm sure uh, um, Joe's story, uh, even uh, uh, Stefan that is there, can also say something. Well, regarding the atlas, a uh, global one, there isn't. There are normally uh, these kinds of checklists and some guidebooks, uh, especially in countries where har wild harvesting has been happening for more years. Um, so this exists. And also in those countries, there are, uh, and I mean France, for instance, uh, uh, northern France, uh, there are um, um, best practices for wild harvesting regarding the seasons where you can harvest, the size of the seaweed and the, the maturity state of the seaweeds in order to preserve the wild populations that are very important to uh, to maintain the ecosystem services that they perform in our coasts. So I c actually, um, that is one of the main issues uh, in, in some of the countries that are starting to develop or that they've been wanting to do so. Uh, and I give you the example even here in Portugal, we've been trying to have these best practices published and implemented and they aren't yet. So, and there have been projects since uh, 2010 at least, a large European net algae that tried to do that uh, and to establish best practices for harvesting and uh, cultivation. Regarding aquaculture, the best practices don't exist yet, but one of the works, uh, working groups of the Normalization Committee is exactly looking at, uh, at these, uh, some of these issues. Even simple things that we may think of, just uh, concepts and def defining what is yield and uh, growth in the uh, production system to be commonly understood by uh, in a more globally way. So kind of lose the more regional aspect of some of those most things. Yeah. yeah. So this, Thanks. This and, is and let me let me go to yours next. So you work in different parts of the world. How, how do you see this? Is there sufficient guidance on how to operate sustainably or? Well, I think uh, that's also yeah in, in progress. Uh, but I would like to use this opportunity to pass the word on to Stefan, my colleague, and who knows everything because I have other obligations right now. And it's a perfect question, I think, to smoothly shift over to Stefan. So, uh, so Stefan, would you uh, take the honors, please? Yeah, no, no problem, Joost. This is a, a very smooth way to. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, on, on the checklist, there's books like this books, uh, yeah, in exactly. many countries, many places. This is for Britain and Ireland, and there are books like that for America, for Canada, for Chile, Peru. Yeah. So you can find all this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. On the regulation, um, there is at the moment uh, European legislation for organically cultivated seaweed. And there is guidelines on, on, on amounts, on how to register, how to uh, put it in the books and all this kind of stuff, stuff that you also can be checked by government yeah. regulations. So that is in existence. Now, of course, if you go to uh, countries like India, for example, where we have an operation that is not well developed yet, uh, but we are working on this. Also, the Indian government has now taken uh, seaweed uh, high on the priority list and they want to be in the top 10 producers in, in a couple of years. So this is all being pushed towards sustainably harvesting. And I already can tell you here and now that wild harvest is 20, 25 years, and then it stops, at least yeah. in Europe. Yes, because yeah. of ecosystem services, on uh, the pressure on it, uh, amenities, uh, coastal resources, it will be phased out. And it yeah. is moving towards cultivation. For the species that we can do that. <laughs> well, for the species that we can do yeah. that, yeah, yeah. But most species you can, as long you as can, you yeah. mind to yeah. it and get the exactly. <laughs> to it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Get the money. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Stephen, for that answer. So, 
there was a follow-up question for Joost. Uh, uh, so he, I think he left. I don't know if you can answer that question, but it is on the uh, how much equity did your company raise up to date, excluding trends? Um, Three million. Three million. Okay. And 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 the second part of that question is where do you see near near term opportunities for large scale farming of seaweeds? Well, first of all, here in Ireland, uh, where I'm based, because Joost is in the Netherlands, I'm actually speaking from you from, from Galway, Ireland. Uh, we have at the moment a application in for four square kilometer. And that, in my eyes, is a reasonable scale up compared to where we are at the moment. But with that come a lot of questions, uh, because if you see wheat in the middle of your farm growing just as fast as on the outside of your farm. So that is still research and, and uh, yeah, a lot of work to figure out. But we want to make that jump to the next level. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And, and, and that touches upon the topic of scalability, which which you mentioned in his presentation as well. Uh, Runa and Elena, how do you look at this? Where's the opportunity to scale up your operations in the near term? Yeah, yeah, I can go uh, first, Runa, if you don't mind. Okay. And also because I connect to what uh, Stefan was just uh, mentioning before. And I think also the question of uh, where is better depends always on the species that you want to farm. So it's not a question of space, also is the conditions of the species that you are looking for uh, upscaling. Um, yes, we uh, regarding more Alga Plus, we are uh, we are in the process of upscaling nowadays. So as I showed in the presentation, we are validating and uh, uh, testing and demonstrating at this point the raceway system that can be applied here in these uh, coastal lagoons. Uh, the place where we are is 14 hectares and we are just using uh, 4.2, uh, um, sorry, 4,000 uh, square meters. Uh, so there is space for scalability at our own property. And more importantly, I think that by validating this type of, uh, of uh, production system uh, of these raceway system that are uh, suitable to be uh, implemented in uh, ecological uh, areas where normally there are there can be some uh, infrastructures that are abandoned that they are not being used uh, and that the communities the coastal communities are have been trying for some years to trying to find something to do with those areas I think that if you can be uh, validated the the potential for upscaling for these species is uh, is large here in Portugal, southern Spain, southern France, uh, Italy, where these types of uh, systems exist also. So it really depends on the species and on the, the production system that is more suitable for each species. And of course, the, the location. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Runa, where's uh, Techno? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, uh, yeah, we're working uh, together with a lot of the seaweed farms there in Norway. and. Uh, what we thought first first was that uh, we wasn't supposed to to cultivate any seaweed ourselves and just buy from from the all or the other seaweed farms. But uh, we have a aquaculture uh, area just outside our production facilities, which the communities uh, wants to have seaweed. So, so that's why we plan to have our own seaweed farm. But uh, but in Norway. It, uh, has been a lot of new seaweed farms coming up, so we just it needs to build the market, and um, then I think we see, I think that we see that Norway has uh, one of the largest uh, seaweed production uh, in a couple of 10, 15 years. Yeah. yeah. If I may add something, just Sander, sure. uh, I, I think that uh, the focus, of course, uh, and I didn't mention this for upscaling, and that's that's common to all of the colleagues that we discuss here in Europe, is the focus in technology and becoming more efficient in terms of uh, label, labor and optimizing our operational costs. Um, and still, uh, uh, still, uh, and w with this, I mean the automation, mechani mechanizing some of the processes that today are still very manual, and that's something that uh, all of us have been uh, investing in the different uh, production systems. And of course, for some species, there are there is still a lot of research to be uh, done, uh, so there is still a, a, a good road to go ahead. Um, yeah. And and I think that uh, the question of the market depends on the species. Uh, so there's. Uh, the push and pull depends on which uh, which species you are uh, working with at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I Thanks. can add something there as well. Sorry, yeah. uh, Sander. But <laughs> on, on the mechanization, uh, you yeah. saw in the presentation, we had to develop our own harvesting machine. We yes. had to develop our own seeding machine. And maybe, I don't know if you can see it, but on the wall there, that's a sugar kelp. 
that we pulled out of the farm. It's four meter forty in length. So you can really grow uh, a considerable biomass if you have your density optimized, if you have your uh, spacing optimized. So what I said, we know how to grow it, but how do you scale up and how do you optimize? That is still in the development. Yeah. That's where we all work on. Yeah, yeah. and it, and it yeah, takes was... time and uh, sorry, and it takes time. And this is just to say when you when you look at companies, uh, especially if you are, it's different if you're farming, if you're processing, if you're uh, the the the. the 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 due time is uh, the, the lead time is yeah. different for different processes yeah. yeah so it takes time when you're uh, trying to set up something that is new because there's a lot of optimization to be done always yeah thanks so so i was about to invite people in the room to ask their questions in the chat so so that we can address them uh, meanwhile a question that popped up on in my head was are you looking at other industries uh, to learn from uh, from them to see where you can automate things or what kind of expertise do you need for that where do you see that well, yeah, go ahead, Lea. Yeah, we've been doing that. Uh, we've been looking a lot to agriculture, orto agriculture, to uh, the agro food industry, basically, because uh, especially because we are working again in the food. So some of the quality criteria are important. They have uh, developed uh, uh, mechanisms and, and machinery that is can be adapted. Of course, it's not straightforward, but can be adapted to uh, to to that, and also uh, some processing of uh, of uh, seafood. Uh, that of course uh, it applies, especially in terms of materials. But yeah, always looking at and the industries I think is much faster. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. How's the seaweed company doing? On on the yeah on, on learning from other other sectors and industries. Yeah. Well, the, the horticultural uh, sector is, of course, one of the the leading parts. Especially if you look at the Netherlands. I mean, they've been doing that forever, right? Uh, so there is systems in place that we can, uh, well, basically steal back and borrow and, and copy and paste. That, that is logical. But also because we are in the ocean, that is different. So you do need to improvise. You need to adapt. And that is a process that once you're actually in this business, you start to learn how to do that and what to do. And that, that just takes time. But well, yeah, I'm in seaweeds for the last 35 years, so I have a bit of an advantage there. But yeah, it, it, it's not a, a straight copying, but you can get, well, uh, how do you say, inspiration from the other industries. Thanks. And I think another topic that I, that I want to explore is the, the end users, the consumers. Um, uh, Runa, you, you mentioned this in your presentation that you did some research into your consumers. How would you characterize them? What kind of people buy these seaweed products? Mm. Now, what we saw first was that uh, it was mostly female at the 45 plus that uh, wanted to try something new. They heard about seaweed and uh, they thought it was interesting. But as we have uh, made uh, new products, we see that uh, we now have a, like 60, 40 advantage of female over male. And it starts to grow towards 50, 50. So, uh, so yeah. So. I think uh, all the people will eat seaweed in uh, just a few years. Yeah. So the male are catching up in, yeah, in consuming yeah. and, and buying <laughs> seaweed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Guys, guy, yeah. I'm not female. I still oh. have it. <laughs> <laughs> How's your experiences uh, in this, Helena? The same? Yeah. Well, well, uh, we well, I don't have here the numbers in terms of females and males, but uh, it's it's quite balanced, I would say. But uh, when I just talk about the surprises, because uh, when we started and uh, uh, we we do a lot of events, public events and uh, fairs and all of these uh, national and internationally uh, to taste, to give people uh, seaweed to taste and seaweed products mostly. And uh, what we have seen is uh, against our uh, expectations in the beginning that we thought that the macro some specific diets like vegetarian or macrobiotics would be more uh, easily would be easily integrating these uh, products in their diet uh, or that they would know more about seaweed. It's not true. So and, and in fact, especially when we talk about uh, uh, European seaweed. So mm -hmm. if you're talking with microbiotics on uh, wakame, ziki, uh, kombu, etc., they know because they've done courses and training on these and they know how to use them, but they are not very open to try different things. And we have, um, and this was an, uh, a surprise. So what we see here, and of course we take the advantage of Portugal eating a lot of products from the sea. We are in the top consumers of uh, sea products. 
Um, actually, uh, the, the seaweed have been very uh, easily taken up by normal, um, I would say not normal people, but normal, <laughs> with normal diets. Yeah. The, the, the traditional Atlantic Mediterranean diet uh, is, is quite easy to integrate seaweed in the, in the food. And we see elderly, uh, we see people that they know very well what they want. They're looking for a specific nutrient and they know that seaweed are rich in that nutrient. So they are looking for that and they know the species. And then we just have people that want to try the, the flavor and that integrate them uh, in, in, their, in their diets. But uh, uh, we've seen, uh, um, I, sometimes we say here internally, especially with my colleague from the marketing that she's been with us since 2013, and we see a big change in these years, and uh, there are new uh, companies, Portuguese com companies coming up, like uh, like uh, Texlo, just uh, uh, developing products and food products. The the large the distribution channels, uh, like uh, the big wholesalers, are including seaweed in their in the shelves. So that's good. So sometimes I say that we've done part of our mission, which was to uh, to kind of make the market to move here with the uh, with the seaweed product so but that the main surprise and especially because we are all talking about plant-based and vegetarian and microbiotics is that there is a, a long way uh, to go also in terms of educating um, mm -hmm. people that are w eating plant-based uh, diets so this is uh, was quite a surprise for us yeah and, and who do you see as your main partners in, in walking down that road towards a more mm -hmm. plant-based diet do you need support from governments, from other companies, retail, where, yeah. where, where was needed? I think it's needed, uh, again, uh, communication, education, and uh, and uh, working in partnership with the uh, food industrials. So uh, not trying to do everything ourselves. And this is something that we've been trying to do, uh, co-branded products or uh, uh, we approaching the food industrials, the traditional and the new, uh, the new companies developing these plant-based products and presenting them with seaweed and of course with all the research that has been done with seaweed uh, because not, there's a lot of uh, species like you mentioned so not everything tastes the same or is the same effect in the final product so it's really important the technical support that you can give to these food industrials but i i would say that it's mostly a job for the companies to promote the development of these uh, of these products that just being waiting for funding from the government i think that is uh, it works well, research uh, and development between companies, yeah. Thanks, thanks. So two questions just popped up, and I think the last one, I can ask that one to, to Runa, uh, but Elena and Stefan, you might have some ideas about this one as well. So how do you look for new formulations? Is that uh, uh, based on seaweed species? How do you uh, look at the, the potential usage of various species in food products? Yeah, so so the most important thing is that uh, some of the big kelps has a lot of iodine in it. So it's uh, mm -hmm. for us using it in like in spices, it's uh, we can use very little of it. So uh, so that's why we sourced mostly sea lacus and dolls for the for the mixed spices. Um, so yeah, and it's a lot lot of uh, history uh, according to the different kind of seaweeds. Mm -hmm. We use that a lot. Read a lot about how they was used. Uh, at earlier times and uh, yeah, it's a lot on, on the taste. We yeah. always want to have the most of the umami taste into the products and uh, we see that it's a little bit different how they meet with the other spices and herbs so um, it's a lot of yeah. trying and uh, testing. Yeah and in your presentation yeah. you mentioned that you work with various retailers. How, how did you experience that cooperation? Is that a, a joint effort to develop new products and formulations? Uh, no, they're just uh, taking in the products to their grocery yeah. store, so yeah. so it's no cooperation be between us and them. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as long as they sell, right, Runa? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So who, who do you need for, for cooperation? What, which, what kind of partners do you need to develop new products and, and applications of seaweeds? Uh, yeah, we need, uh, yeah, for for other markets than Norway, we uh, at least least uh, need uh, distributors, um, and uh, yeah, that's the most important one. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just, just, so for us, it's yeah. slightly different, Sander, yeah. uh, because we're talking about formulations here. Yeah, we base everything on the bioactive compounds. 
and especially if you look at either biostimulant or on animal feed products for equine or poultry or swine, we look at what is improving gut health, what uh, polysaccharides, for example, or what sterols or polyphenols and what they can do in the body to improve either uh, digestibility of the diet so that your feed conversion ratio goes lower <coughs> and you get more bang for your buck, basically, or where you improve well, well-being of the animals. Yeah. So it's yield and optimizing health. Yeah. And they often go by, by the way, t in tandem anyway. Yeah. And and just adding something to that, that uh, and uh, like like Stefan was saying, both in feed and also in food, that's a very important aspect. And and then is the uh, you need to notice the needs. Uh, in our in our case, we work with uh, blends and uh, sometimes formulation, even within the seaweed that we produce or that we source by from partners. And is the question of understanding your customers' needs. I think that's uh, what should leave the formulation should need, should be the need of your customer. That's how we think about it normally. Yeah. Thanks. Let's 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 go back to production because there are two questions on that. Um, one is on the uh, productivity and consistency uh, over time and and different size of the farm. Uh, it's addressed to Stefan and Runer. So so how what what are your experiences here? I guess Stefan uh, can uh, answer that one as we don't uh, uh, have our own seaweed farm yet. So I think he's best okay. to say something about yeah. that. Well, again, very dependent on the species eh? and also where you are in the world. See, in Ireland, we do basically two types. The, the one that I just showed you on, on, on my camera uh, and Atlantic Bacame or Alaria. And we are working with, with numbers uh, if you do rope seeding uh, five to seven kilos per meter. If it's down to net seeding, so you basically cultivate on a different system, you start to work with square meter numbers, and that can be around 20 kilos per square meter. And then you can <coughs> multiply that with your, your yield from a hectare. And you, you're somewhere around 20 metric tons wet per hectare. But that's for Alaria. Now, if we go to the farm in India, where we do the Grasalaria, that's a different way because they grow in, in a type of socks. Mm -hmm. Certain, on top of that, they harvest four times up to five times a year from the same crop. So the numbers change. So they get eight tons per hectare, but they can do it four or five times a year. And in Morocco, yeah. it's more free floating uh, seaweed yeah. where we have access to. Thanks. So I hope that answers the question. Um, and another question is on the technolo technological barriers that are faced by, by your companies, I guess by all three of them, although they might differ. So, so what do you see as the main technological barrier uh, for your operations? Uh, I can talk yeah. on, yeah. I mean, for us, it's been to to be able to again to have uh, uh, the automation in the in the harvesting of the <coughs> of the raceways because we harvest, we have a fixed team. So uh, again, uh, this always depends on the species. But uh, as uh, Stefan was saying, it's very different to work on kelp and to work on a species that you are uh, harvesting uh, uh, year round. So your team is normally more uh, more larger and more stable. So what we need to, uh, our main issue has been to focus on uh, while at the same time we are upscaling to have uh, an automated uh, harvesting system that can uh, can be very efficient in um, in our daily harvest that we do because yeah. we have a rotation system for our our uh, our harvesting. Yep. The other thing would be to uh, I would say integrate because in this type of production that we work on is to integrate uh, uh, that we kind of do it already, but look at the uh, uh, to have forecasts on your productivity, depending on the uh, on the climate or on the weather that is coming in. And this is something that exists in an R&D scale. But when we are talking about upscale again, it becomes uh, quite costly uh, still to invest in a, in a kind of a, in, in that ty types of systems um, and models that can uh, they can mm -hmm. forecast your production. So this is something that is quite important in our uh, kind of operation, especially now where while well, we, we are in June and we should be having light and sunny weather and it's raining and it's low temperatures in Portugal. So this changes all your models and forecasts. Yeah. <laughs> of so production. we have better weather actually. Okay. <laughs> you see, I told you at the beginning. Yeah. Thanks. Runner, any Technological barriers that you face? 
Yeah, for us it's most uh, mostly on the drying uh, kind. Of, uh, yeah. So uh, today we have uh, we made an optimal uh, solution for drying small quantities. So today we can dry uh, 500 kilos of uh, Laminara Hyperborea in 72 hours you know, on 30 degrees for just 20 euro cost in electricity. But to take that up to a larger scale and uh, to uh, to dry like uh, 100 ton in just uh, three to four weeks, that's uh, that's a big barrier. Thanks. I see Tamara has turned off, turned on yeah. the camera, which yeah. <laughs> must be a sign yeah, that we well. are uh, about to end this meeting. Uh, I see it's already six. Uh, yeah, I hate to end the discussion. Yeah. I, I think it's really great. We thank you very much to our wonderful speakers and to, to the audience for the very good questions. I see there's a lot more coming in. So uh, if you, when you registered, um, you got on our mailing list. I'll be sending out the profiles of each of these companies, so you will be able to ask some more questions and contact them. Delighted to have you guys. It's a super important topic in my mind. I think we're humanity's facing all these challenges, and seaweed has the potential to solve a lot of them. So really glad to have the discussion. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the contact info again. I hope you enjoyed the event. It's one of TMA's you know, connecting networking events and you're welcome to explore membership with us um, and, and get more of those perks. So it's my shameless plug for the day. Um, thank well, you very much, Sander, for joining. We are our own shameless plugs today, so that is fine, uh, Tamara. <laughs> we all, yeah. <laughs> Great, I'll uh, be yeah. sending out the profiles and the um, recording links. So please check out our YouTube channel and look at all of our Blue Tech Global Connects. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Nice seeing you, you all. Bye. 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 Cheers. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Samara. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much.